Welcome to the lecture on tree structure. In this lecture, we're going to talk about how trees are classified, what kinds of characteristics set trees apart from other plants, and then we'll talk about some of the primary structures of leaves, stems, and roots, and what the different cell types are in, in those different um, or, organs. During this lecture, it it's a really good idea to follow along in the lecture outline provided to you. You can either fill in the outline document uh, on your computer using Microsoft Word, or you can print it out and take notes by hand. It's up to you. So let's start um, talking about what characteristics set trees apart from other plants. And you can probably think of most of these just off the top of your head. Most of them are pretty straightforward, but probably the most obvious one is that trees can grow, grow very large. Trees are really the largest organisms on Earth. This is the General Sherman. It's the largest non-clonal uh, tree on Earth. And its size, in this case, is measured by stem volume. So it has the largest stem volume of any tree. This is coast redwood, Sequoia sempervirens. Coast redwoods are the tallest trees on Earth. Just note this sign stating the obvious uh, says big tree, in case you don't notice when you walk up to it. This is a, a scale here. These images are to scale. The left is the Bull Creek Giant. When trees get this big, sometimes they're given names. Uh, this is not the tallest redwood on Earth, but this redwood is 330 feet tall. And it's shown there with the Statue of Liberty for scale. So uh, trees can, can get really tall. One of the really interesting characteristics of trees uh, in terms of their height is that the height of trees uh, interacts with their hydraulics, their ability of xylem to transport water. And we'll talk about that later in the semester. So here's uh, again, a scale drawing of some of the tallest trees in the world relative to some iconic objects or structures. So Hyperion is the tallest publicly recorded coast redwood, 116 meters tall. That's really tall. There are likely some taller trees that have been measured, but the scientific community is not publicly reporting those because they have trouble with people finding these trees and visiting them and trampling their roots and so on. So you can actually find directions to Hyperion on the, on the web. And there's been some impact around it. So great size is, is one of the characteristics. And another is profound secondary growth. In contrast to some other classifications of plants, trees have significant secondary growth, which means they have significant growth in thickness. Uh, so tree stems can get very big around, branches can get big around and so on. So that's another characteristic that sets trees apart from other plants. And a third characteristic is longevity. Trees can live to be very old. Uh, this, uh, the maximum measured age for a tree is over 4,800 years. That's a bristlecone pine in Nevada. Um, again, these are non-clonal trees. Uh, some clonal organisms uh, can live longer and be larger, but uh, I'm speaking specifically of non-clonal organisms or individuals. <clears throat> There's a story that many of you may be familiar with related to how the oldest Bristlecone pine was discovered 
unfortunately, it was cut down by a graduate student. So um, Donald Curry in the 60s was a geology graduate student studying glacial moraines in Nevada. And he was coring bristlecone pine trees, got his borer stuck in one, and asked the district ranger for help. And the district ranger came up and helped him cut down this tree, which ended up being the oldest tree ever recorded. Uh, that's really unfortunate. And it's unfortunate because Dr. Curry went on to have a, a great career in geology. But uh, when you look him up on Wikipedia, this is what he's known for, unfortunately. So trees can live, live to a great age. This one may be less obvious to some of you, but compartmentalization is a really important characteristic of trees that sets them apart from many other plants. Uh, this is an example uh, showing the different um, levels of compartmentalization that can occur when a tree stem, for instance, is wounded. There are actually four different wound responses apparent in this tree stem, which shows its response to this injury or wound or infection that occurred. And that helps to separate off that wounded area or that infected area and prevent pathogens from spreading further into the body of the tree. So that compartmentalization is an important characteristic of trees and probably really contributes to their longevity for instance. So compartmentalization is the fourth characteristic. And the fifth is that trees have a single axis. That's one thing that, you know, sometimes you'll see arguments about what is a tree and what isn't. You might have woody perennials that some people don't characterize as a tree because they have multiple stems and they call those shrubs, for instance. So in general, most definitions of trees include they have a single stem, a single axis in most cases in their growth, growth form. So those are the characteristics that set trees apart from other plants. So let's talk about how trees are classified. Trees in general fall into two broad classifications, angiosperms and gymnosperms. So angiosperms, are flowering plants. Um, they produce a seed encased within a, within a fruit. Um, and they're more evolutionarily recent than gymnosperms, which is the other characteristic that, or the other classification that trees fall into. So I'm gonna talk first about angiosperms and we can further break trees out into two groups within the angiosperms. So the angiosperms can be either monocots or dicots. So let me talk about the characteristics of monocots and dicots. The first is, is where they derive their name. Monocots have a single cotyledon. The cotyledon is just the seed leaf. That's the first leaf that's produced when a seed germinates. And monocots have one of those, and dicots have two of those. So that's where they actually get their names. It's single cotyledon for monocots or a double cotyledon for dicots. Another characteristic of monocots and dicots is their leaf vasculature. In monocots, generally, they have parallel leaf veins. So this is an example from a corn plant. You can see that the leaf veins in the corn leaf are parallel to each other. Whereas in dicots, like this oak, the leaf veins form a network, sort of a web or net-like network of veins. So the leaf vasculature structure is, is another thing that distinguishes monocots from dicots. Okay, secondary growth is another example. So monocots do not have significant secondary growth. And this is an example of palms. Palms are the only monocot tree. 
So palms do not have secondary growth. You look at a really short palm and look at the width of its stem. And then if you came back 100 years later, when it was really tall, its stem would be the same height. They have no significant secondary growth. Whereas dicots, in this case, this is a live oak tree. This is the Selen oak north of Gainesville. They have significant secondary growth in some cases. So dicots can have secondary growth, monocots don't. The fourth characteristics is the, is the structure of the vasculature in their stem. So in monocots, this is a cross section of a monocot stem, the xylem and phloem tissue are gathered together in vascular bundles. So each of these dots in this monocot stem is a vascular bundle. And each of those vascular bundle, bundles contains some xylem and some phloem, okay? Whereas in dicots, in their vascular system, in secondary uh, stems, the phloem and the xylem are spatially separated from each other. So in dicot stems, the phloem exists in a thin layer around the outside of the stem, whereas the xylem consists of everything within the vascular cambium, and they're separated from each other. So in monocots, xylem and phloem are together in each of those vascular bundles. In dicots, xylem and phloem are spatially distinct. Okay. So that, those are the main differences between monocots and dicots. Some examples of monocots. So I already showed you corn. So corn and other grasses are monocots. The only monocot tree, like I mentioned, are palm trees. So palms are really unique uh, in terms of their classification because they are monocots. Dicot angiosperms are basically all of what we would cons consider non-conifer trees. So broadleaf trees is what foresters would often call them. So oaks, elms, hickories, um, sweet gums, you name it. Vast um, diversity of angiosperm dicot trees. So this is a, a large category, large diversity of, of trees in that category, okay? Gymnosperms are the second main category, and those consist of the non-flowering trees. Um, so these are, these are the conifers. They don't produce true flowers. They don't produce true fruits. They actually uh, produce their seed on woody structures like cones, usually, or cone-like structures. So this is part of my pine cone collection in my office. And the seeds in gymnosperms are born naked on these woody bracts. So this is a, a, a scale of a cone. You can see this little indentation where the two seeds sat on this sugar pine cone. You can see this was the wing of the seed. This is the body of the seed. When that cone opened up, those seeds were dispersed. But there's not a true fruit around these seeds. Those seeds are born naked. And that naked seed is the root of the Greek root of that name, gymnosperm, naked seed. So it's gymnosperm seeds are born naked on those bracts. No true flowers, no true fruits. Okay, so anything that we consider a conifer, pines, firs, spruces, um, bald cypress, and so on, those are all gymnosperms. Sometimes foresters will call gymnosperms softwoods and angiosperms hardwoods. Terrible names because many gymnosperms have very hard wood 
And there are also, of course, angiosperms with very soft, soft wood. Balsa wood is a, an angiosperm tree with very soft wood. And, and southern pines actually can have very hard wood. So I don't call them hardwoods and softwoods. Um, evergreen and deciduous, maybe a little bit better, but there's still exceptions because, of course, as you know, there are evergreen angiosperms. Many trees in Florida, for instance, many angiosperms are evergreen. Magnolias, a lot of our live, live oaks and other oaks keep green leaves all year round. Whereas, of course, there are also deciduous gymnosperms like uh, bald cypress or larch. Those are gymnosperms that lose their leaves in the fall. So throughout this class, I'll refer to those categories of trees as angiosperms and gymnosperms. OK, so let's talk a little bit about leaf structure or leaf anatomy. What are the roles of leaves? It's pretty obvious. Uh, leaves are the main photosynthetic organs for trees. They're also the main route by which water is lost. So they're the major route of water loss. And then the third role is that leaves can also store carbohydrates and nutrients. So they can also be short-term storage organs. So this, is, this diagram shows the general structure of an angiosperm leaf. So this is a cross section of a leaf. We had a leaf like this and turned it on its edge and then cut it open. This is what you'd see. So on the outside surface of the leaf, there's a cuticle. The cuticle is a waxy deposition on top of the epidermis layer. So the next layer in are the epidermal cells. The cuticle is a waxy layer that's relatively impervious to water vapor. So it keeps those epidermal leaves from losing water very quickly. And that epidermis is on, on both sides of the leaf. And then in this upper layer, these are parenchyma or mesophyll cells. Sometimes I'll call these mesophyll cells. That just means they're moist, wet cells. Those palisade parenchyma are columnar in shape. You see they're oriented in a columnar shape. And then further down is spongy parenchyma or spongy mesophyll. All of, all of these cells have chloroplasts, but there's lots of chloroplasts in these parenchyma or mesophyll cells. So these are the primary pho photosynthetic cells. Interestingly, studies have shown that these palisade parenchyma are actually designed or are, have evolved in a way that helps to distribute uh, radiation deeper into thick leaves. So people have taken tiny fiber optic light probes and drilled them down into leaves. And they've noted that those palisade parenchyma, part of their function is they help to distribute light deeper within leaves, which is really an interesting adaptation. Spongy parenchyma, have lots of air spaces between them. Uh, and so it looks like a sponge. And that the advantage to that is that exposes lots of surface of these cells to air, which enables efficient exchange of CO2 with the air, so the uptake of CO2 for photosynthesis. You've got a, a vascular bundle in this leaf that contains xylem and phloem. Now note that this, this is essentially a leaf vein. So this vascular bundle is a leaf vein. It contains both xylem and phloem. This is true in angiosperm and gymnosperm uh, trees. So when I mentioned vascular bundles in stem cross sections, I was speaking of secondary stem. In this case, is, in this case xylem and phloem do occur together in leaf veins. And then, uh, embedded in the epidermal surface are stomata. Stomata are microscopic pores in the leaf which enable the uptake of CO2 and as a consequence, the loss of water vapor from the leaf. Okay, so that's stomata and, and I'll talk a little bit more about the structure and function of stomata in a minute. 
we see a lot of the same structures in gymnosperm leaves. So this is a cross section of a pine needle. And you can see the pine needle also have, has a cuticle layer and epidermal cells as well. It has stomata embedded in its surface and it has a spongy parenchyma here. Gymnosperms can also have palisade parenchyma as well, but this, this particular leaf does not have palisade parenchyma. This uh, pine needle also has resin ducts, and you can see uh, the resin duct here. That contains resin produced by live cells around the outside of that resin duct. And resin is a sticky, aromatic substance that serves uh, as a defense compound. Um, it's under pressure, so if a small herbivore were to encounter a resin duct either in a leaf or in a stem, it might either become stuck in that resin or be expelled by that resin. And, and it also doesn't taste good and doesn't have nutritive value. So it's a defense against herbivores and in some cases against insects and pathogens. I want to take a slight tangent here for a minute and distinguish between sap and resin, because I think sometimes people get those confused. And this isn't in your notes, but I do want you to remember this. So sap, generally within the context of how I would talk about it, is the contact, contents of xylem and phloem cells. It's primarily water with some nutrients and sugars dissolved in it. And sap within phloem and xylem serves a transport function. That sap carries nutrients uh, or sugars throughout the plant in the xylem and phloem tissue system. In contrast, resin is a sticky aromatic substance produced by those living epithelial cells in the resin canals. And it has a defense fu function. So when you're cutting down a Christmas tree, for instance, or a pine tree, and you get that sticky stuff on your hands that smells like the pine tree, you're smelling resin. You're not smelling sap. So don't let me catch you saying you smell the sap. So just to clarify, in this case, this is someone collecting um, uh, a watery substance from sugar maple trees to make maple syrup. That is sap. That is xylem sap that's used to make maple syrup. So maple syrup is just reduced xylem sap. This is an example of someone tapping a pine tree to make turpentine. And that's an example of resin. Pine trees uh, used to be tapped uh, to produce resin to make turpentine and other naval stores. There's a whole industry based on that. So that is resin. So again, make sure to make the distinction between those two substances. Okay, let's talk a little bit about stomata. Um, stomata, the sing singular is stomate or stoma. Stomata is the plural. Stomata, again, are microscopic pores in the epidermis of leaves and they're surrounded by two guard cells. So this is an example of a stomata in the surface of an angiosperm leaf. So we're looking at the surface of an angiosperm leaf this way, and we can see the epidermal cells and this stomatal complex embedded in the surface, and then the two guard cells around that pore. Those two guard cells are living, and the cartoon that I think about when I think about guard cells are, uh, you know, those balloons that clowns air up to make balloon animals. So it's two long balloons with radially, radially arranged cellulose microfibrils around them. So they're, the shape and the fact that they're connected at the ends means that when those guard cells are fully hydrated or turgid, they swell up and open. 
because they're connected at the ends. So uh, they have no way to go but out when they're fully turgid. So when those guard cells are fully turgid, they're open. As those guard cells lose turgid, lose um, fluid and become less turgid, because of those microfibrils, those radially arranged microfibrils, those act as a spring and actually then pull the cells straight up and down, and that causes them to close. That um, movement is under active control by the tree. And we'll talk in a later lecture about the physiology of guard cells. Okay, so that special shape and those microfibrils allow guard cells to open and close. Now, the second point I wanted to make uh, in this item on your notes is that stomata on conifers um, are arranged differently. Stomata on, on conifers are sunken below the epidermis. So this is a cross section of a gymnosperm leaf. Here's the epidermis. And this is the sto stoma stomate and the guard cells sunken down below the surface. So in angiosperms, generally stomata and the guard cells are right on the epidermal surface. In gymnosperms, they're sunken below the surface. Um, and we can take a look at the structure of guard cells by taking epidermal peels. So I'm going to show you some magnifications in a couple of epidermal peels. And epidermal peels are just, you can, you can take either paint or in this case, uh, clear fingernail polish and paint it onto the surface of the leaf. Let that paint dry and then put a piece of clear cellophane tape onto that paint, peel it off, and place it onto a microscope slide. And then you can look at the impression of that leaf surface under the microscope. So this is the impression or an epidermal peel of an angiosperm. So this is, I believe, citrus. And you can see here are all the um, epidermal cells. And each of these is a sto stomata, a stomate with its guard cells. Here's another set of guard cells, another set of guard cells. So you can see those are right on the same plane as the epidermal cells. In contrast, the epidermal peel of the surface of a pine needle looks very different. So we don't see any guard cells. So this is at 100x. I'm going to zoom in. So here we can see um, epidermal cells on this surface. And then instead of guard cells, we just see these holes in the epidermis. That's because the guard cells are sunken down underneath the epidermal plane. So the guard cells are down in there. So we don't capture the guard cells. We just capture the opening caused by um, that stomatal antechamber. So there's structural difference uh, in guard cells and their arrangement in angiosperms and in gymnosperms like pines. The third and fourth point on your handout that I want to make is the arrangement of stomata. So stomata can be arranged uh, in hypostomatous or in amphistomatous arrangement. Hypostomatous arrangement means that all of the stomata just occur on the abaxial or bottom surface of the leaf. Okay? Whereas in amphistomatous leaves and species that, that are amphistomatous, stomata can, stomata can occur on the top or on the bottom. Now in, in amphistomatous uh, species, there generally still tends to be more stomata on the bottom but there also may be stomata on the top. So most angiosperms are hypostomatous. Okay, there's a couple of exceptions. So for instance, uh, poplars and willows, so populus and salix, are amphistomatous. They have some stomata on the top surface. 
And then things like pines. Pines have stomata on all of their leaf surfaces as well. So you could consider pines to be amphistomatous as well. <clears throat> okay, I want to talk just briefly about um, crown structure or crown anatomy. So there are two broad types of crown anatomy, excurrent and decurrent crown anatomy. So this is an example of excurrent crown anatomy. Basically, you have a very distinct leader um, and sort of an organized, almost Christmas tree shape to the crown. Whereas decurrent species have, you know, not a, they don't have an obvious leader and sort of a much broader open crown. Those differences in excurrent and de decurrent crown structure, and I'm gonna write this down on the notes so that you can see, are caused by differences in apical dominance. So apical dominance just refers to, and I'm gonna uh, zoom in a little bit so you can see my typing. So apical dominance refers to the suppression of lateral branch formation and growth by hormones produced in the terminal bud. Okay, so apical dominance refers to the suppression of lateral branch formation and growth by hormones produced in the terminal bud. So excurrent and decurrent tree species, those differences are caused by differences in apical dominance. So excurrent tree species like this are caused by strong apical dominance. Okay, so species like um, firs or young pines are examples of species with excurrent crown form. So in contrast, decurrent crown form, as you might guess now, is caused by weak apical dominance. You can imagine in a crown form like this, um, that terminal, if you could even find it, is, is not strongly suppressing the growth of laterals, and that allows lots of lateral branches to basically um, grow at similar rates, and, and that results in that difference in crown form. Okay, so examples, you know, the elms are the, are the classic decurrent crowns, uh, crown shape. They're shaped like vases. People often describe them as that. Um, so willows, another example, is a, no, a number of, of decurrent crown shapes. Okay. That's the first part of the anatomy lecture. And the next one, we'll talk about stem and root structure and function.